invite you to turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Colossians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Colossian believers, is explaining to them um, how they need to grow up in Christ. The whole idea is coming to maturity in Christ, but how do we do that? How is that possible? We're going to start verse 16, as Paul writes, and he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. When we trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, we immediately became new creations in Christ Jesus. We were complete in him. Tom Hansen mentioned the idea of about and we have everything we need in Christ Jesus. That's absolutely true. So we're all complete in him, and yet at the same time, we're called upon to grow and to develop and become more like Jesus in terms of our daily walk until ultimately we see him face to face. We're really dealing with two distinct issues, trusting Christ as Savior and growing in Christ. Call it salvation and sanctification, call it getting saved and growing to maturity or born again and developing as a believer, but those two issues are involved. So Paul was writing to a group of people who had trusted Jesus as Savior, who were living in and around the town of Colossae, and he was aware of their relationship to Christ, and he reminded them of what happened to them because of Christ. Again, Tom had mentioned um, something, and David did as well, as he was setting us up to talk to the Lord in prayer, where Paul wrote to the Colossians, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's describing our salvation. That's what happened. Sometime along the way, if you are in Christ Jesus, he got a hold of you, drew you to himself, transferred you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. So you belong to him. You're in his realm. You're in his kingdom. You are in Christ Jesus. That's the way it would be described as a believer. But then the apostle goes on to say, in fact, in chapter 1, verse 28, he said, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So we go from having been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, from the king, to the kingdom of light, if you will. And now we're to come to maturity in that relationship. And that's what he was talking about. Well, how does that happen? How do we come to, to maturity in Jesus Christ? That's what we got to talk about. This is where the process sometimes can be confused. What does it mean to be maturing in Christ, and how do we measure that? For many in Colossae, there were several opinions, and just as there were opinions in Colossae, so there are lots of opinions and theories today. And I don't know that really things have changed all that much. Some people measure their, their spirituality, their maturity in Jesus. They measure that by what they do keeping certain laws and traditions and doing certain things like that. Some measure their spirituality by the experiences they have. Others measure their spirituality by what they don't do. So we're going to look at those three theories because that's essentially what the Apostle Paul is doing in this text and helping us to see how those are really not a measure for our maturity in Christ. And actually, if those are our objective, they actually work opposite 
toward bringing us to maturity in Jesus. So let's start with strictly keeping religious traditions. I'm going to call that legalism. Here's what he says, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So what's involved in keeping religious traditions? All right, to help us get a hold of this, I'm going to do a little scenario thing. Okay, so good morning. It's good to see so many of you out on this wonderful Christian Sabbath. I, I certainly would, would not miss a service. I mean, I'm here every time the door is open. After all, you know, we are to keep the Sabbath day holy. I'm certain God would pour out his holy wrath on me if I failed to show up. I'm certainly glad I'm spiritual enough to recognize that. It makes me feel good that I am so in tune with what pleases God. Following the service, the little wife and, and, and the kids and I will have our traditional Sunday meal. I can't believe that people would actually go to restaurants on Sunday. Such unspiritual people. I have my doubts about their sincerity, about the sincerity of them being Christians. Oh, by the way, how long is this service supposed to last? I'm really quite hungry. To which somebody interrupts and says, didn't you have breakfast? I had bacon and eggs and toast. And you say, you what? How could you eat such things and call yourself a Christian? I bet you even drank coffee. I can't believe, did you know that some churches actually serve coffee during Sunday school? It's bad enough that professing Christians drink the stuff, but actually serve it in God's house? I thank God that I'm not given to such heathen behavior. That's kind of legalism wouldn't you say? But frankly, I've heard things like that and been part of some of that and watched that play out over the years that I've been a Christian, and so have you. In fact, when I was growing up as a, as a grade school and junior high and high school student, I went to a church that measured basically spiritual maturity by what you did or didn't do. For example, I, I wrote this in a blog this week. Some of you read that, no, but um, in, my, in my church, it was the filthy five. You couldn't do the filthy five. And that was smoking, drinking, playing cards, dancing, and going to movies. Now, as long as you didn't do any of those, you were spiritual. But if you did any of those, oh my goodness, you were in bad shape. You were a heathen, okay? Now, you could do all those other things like gossip, um, be a, a total jerk about, you know, with other people, and that was okay as long as you didn't do the filthy five. Now, maybe you went to a church that had the, um, the um, sinful six, or you might have had the, um, the four or the three or the ten or whatever, um, but the point is that those were the things that were looked upon as if you did these things, then you were really bad. Well, what does it mean to be legalistic? Well, Paul talked about diets and days, and certainly they were important in the Old Testament economy. God had reasons for dietary laws and certain feast days. Many of those things had physical and health reasons attached to them. I mean, and during a time when there was not refrigeration and a time when certain bacteria and so forth was there, God protected his people in that way. Some of those laws had as their primary purpose to train and discipline the nation of Israel, preparing them for the coming of Messiah. They also were used to demonstrate a difference from the world around them. In other words, God said he wanted a people who was unique, who was different than the world. And so they had certain laws that they were to keep. The feast days and some of the laws were actually a picture of Christ. To use Paul's terminology, those religious exercises were a shadow. They were really a picture. They were showing what was yet to come. And then when Christ came, the shadow was no longer important because now the substance had arrived. So in the Old Testament, remember, let me give you one example. Um, in the Old Testament, when you came to the temple or the tabernacle, depending on the time we're speaking of, and you, if you sinned, what did you need to do? Bring a sacrifice. So animals were sacrificed in order that, that um, it might demonstrate my understanding that because of sin brought death, but also understanding that some, something else would take 
the place of my death, namely that this animal would become the substitute for me. Now, you've noticed we don't kill any animals here. Why not? Because the one ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, died once for all for our sins, and so there's no longer any need for that. So there's the symbol or the picture or the shadow now becomes the reality. A lot of things that happened in Israel was the shadow, now it's the reality. Read the book of Hebrews. It'll help you understand that. Diets and days are of far less significance to the believer today. 1 Corinthians 8.8, 8, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Now, well, that might not be true physically. For example, if I make my, oh, I can do it again. If I make my diet Twinkies and, um, and Coke, then I probably won't be very healthy physically. But if that was the case, that still doesn't necessarily affect my spiritual life, okay? You might think that's not a good thing for me to do physically, but it, it's, that's not a, what we're talking about here in terms of the spiritual realm. So Paul is saying whether you eat vegetables or meat, whether you eat only beef or you eat pork, it's, it's, not, it's not a concern. That's not the issue. So he makes that case We've been granted much freedom in Christ, according to Galatians 5.1. There, there are warnings as to how we are to use our freedom, but abstaining or doing certain amoral things does not make us more Christ-like. To say it another way, the external stuff that we do is not an accurate measurement for the internal maturity we have in Christ. Now, I'm not talking about immoral stuff. I'm talking about amoral stuff. What does legalism produce? Typically, legalism produces an inflated ego and a judgmental spirit, uh, particularly in the one who is keeping the, that set of regulations. Um, how many times have you watched this play out where somebody's doing something that they probably, well, they could do, but you think that it's wrong? And so, not just thinking that's wrong, but then, I am so glad that I'm not heathen like they are. Let me give you an example. I grew up um, believing that, in some ways, that some of the Old Testament texts carried over into the New Testament in terms of what we should do and what we should not do. And so we were taught um, throughout growing up that it was absolutely a sin to work on Sunday in any way, measure, any form. Now, you may have views on that, about that, um, in terms of God giving us opportunity to set a day apart where we give our worship to him, and that's certainly appropriate. But as far as saying that if you work on Sunday in some way that the church is obligated to stone you to death is probably not where we're going to take that. You understand what I'm saying from the Old Testament law? But I believe that it was wrong to do that, and so this was put in my head and beat in my brain. For example, sometimes we have a lot of rain, and the grass grows. And I only have certain times during the week that I can mow my grass. Suppose it rains on my day off. and I can't do that. And so my grass is becoming almost ready to bale instead of mow. And so I need to take care of that. And it's Sunday afternoon. What do I do? My response would be not do it. Because I feel uncomfortable with that. All right. That's okay to do that. That's all right. But if I drive home this afternoon and I see some of my neighbors mowing their grass, if I say, look at those heathen, they're not, they're probably not believers, and if they are, they're really being in, immature, then what's wrong with that? What's wrong? That's, that's the legalism that I begin to apply to the situation. So what has happened is I've gained an inflated ego and a judgmental spirit 
even though maybe the desire is to please God. You see how that works? Legalism produces that. It also produces an intimidating challenge to the one being compared. That's why Paul reinforces his point here when he says, do not let anyone judge you. It's hard to argue with somebody who claims that they are keeping all the right rules. You know, maybe if you ever get spiritual, you'll see the need to get in step, we say. However, do not forget that when Jesus died for us, he fulfilled the law, he completed his work, to judge a believer for not keeping certain aspects of the Jewish law, in effect, is to judge Jesus and to claim that his work was left undone. So we have to be careful. Let's go on to the next one. And that is openly propagating religious experiences. He says in verses 18 and 19, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. In essence, Paul is talking about, I'm, I'm not using this in a technical sense, but basically he's talking about some kind of mysticism. Uh, some do not measure their spirituality by what they do, but they do measure their spirituality with the experiences that they have had. Again, let me, let me kind of set this up for you in some little sort of scenario. Hey, how's it going? You'll never believe what God told me last night. I was just going off to sleep, and I saw an angel who, who told me to pay close attention. God had, chosen, God had chosen to reveal his plan and timetable to me. Can you believe it? The angel took my hand, and we walked through the gates of heaven. It was the most brilliant, magnificent place you could ever imagine. We walked into the golden palace, and there was a large room with three thrones, and I saw the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit sitting there. And you say, wait a minute. I thought the Bible said that no one has seen the Father and that really we'd only see Jesus. And you go, listen, don't argue with my experience. It happened. Anyway, the father told me that in nine weeks he was going to totally destroy the world except for me and my family and all who would listen. I'm supposed to drive to Kentucky and enter Mammoth Cave. I'm to have provisions for my followers. God is going to bring a deadly plague on the whole world. Only those with me will survive. And you go, wait a minute. God promised the next time d destruction came, it would be by fire. And many other events will likely occur first. Listen, that's your interpretation. That's only what you read. That's what, this is what God has told me personally. I'm already scheduled to appear on four TV talk shows in the next three weeks. I'm just so blessed that God has chosen me. I must be doing something right. Well, I must get ready to appear tonight on TV in Chicago. Make sure you tune in. Now, maybe that's a little bit corny, but that's often what happens when people begin to elevate their experience over what the Word of God says, particularly when that experience is contradictory to what Scripture says. So what does it mean to be mystic, and, and what, what are the results? Well, uh, the mystic is in danger of being robbed of spiritual reward, according to verse 18. The word that Paul uses here when he says the word disqualify, it's actually a word that was used um, in athletics, uh, for an official or umpire who makes a decision against an athlete, the one who broke the rules. And so when Paul says in verse 18 of chapter 2, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in these questions, verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. There's always been a fascination with religious mysticism, learning supposed secrets, uh, having contact with the spirit world. By the, there, there's some uh, disturbing statistics that are out there. A quarter of professing evangelicals, I'm not talking about just professing Christians, but professing evangelical Christians believe in contacting the dead. 25%. All of these things seem so exciting, but the result will be defeat and quite possibly even tragedy. The mystic is in danger of missing the avenue of real spiritual growth, according to verse 19. To replace the emphasis on Jesus with some other emphasis is to bypass the source and the goal of potential spiritual growth. The byproducts of this kind of approach to spiritual maturity is, first of all, false humility. Um, 
the idea it's, it's humbling to be chosen by God to do this great work. It sounds good, but, it, but it's sort of like being proud that you're humble. Uh, John MacArthur, in one of his little commentaries, wrote, Humility, the, I think he's quoting somebody else, but humility, the sweetest, loveliest flower that blossomed in Eden and first that died has rarely blossomed since on mortal soil. It is so frail... So delicate a thing, tis gone if it but looks upon itself. And he who ventures to esteem it proves by that single thought that he has it not. I think it was Warren Wearsby who used to say that humility is one of those things that when you know you've got it, you've lost it. And what happens when we begin to develop a system, whether it's legalism or mysticism, where somehow the emphasis is all on us, we become puffed up at aren't we something special that we have these, that we have these experiences, and then we're moving in the wrong direction away from Christ. Not only is there false humility that's developed, but also a faulty religious system. The Gnostics would say that they worshipped angels rather than the supreme God. Now, there were a couple of reasons for that, but one of them was, it was like, well, you see, I'm such a humble person that for me to worship God would just be way off the charts. So I'm going to worship something less than God that shows my humility. But that's not what we're told to do in Scripture, that we are to worship only God not some form of God's creation. There were more, sp they were, um, that whole idea was, was bizarre. Um, even people, and, and I, I'm going to get in a little bit of trouble here because I know we're not all on the same page exactly on this point, but, but ultimately, it's not about what you think God is saying now. It's about what he has said. The idea of God speaking now, even though God is a speaking God, primarily, appropriately, he, he speaks through his word. So that when we read the word, we discover his will and his purpose. Peter made it very clear that, that we have everything in Christ and in his word for life and godliness. So there's really nothing else that needs to be added to that. And Peter was writing... He was speaking about something that happened to him that was very amazing. Think about this. Peter and James and John had the opportunity to go with Jesus up on a mountain. And while they were there, some amazing experience happened. You remember? Jesus started to glow. His essential glory began to come through literally his clothing, and his clothes began to glow. His body began to glow and the uh, these three guys were were witnesses of that and then out of from beyond the grave or beyond beyond mortal life comes two people from the past Moses and Elijah and they're standing there speaking with Jesus and these three guys are watching that they're this is an incredible example of an amazing experience. And yet Peter says this about that after he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Then he says, you would think he would say, too bad the rest of you couldn't have such incredible experiences or something. He says, and we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's saying it was a great experience. It was an amazing experience, but we have something even more sure. We have the Word of God. And that's where we need to put our emphasis. <laughs> I came across this. I, I hesitated even to read it. But this, this is from uh, the days of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was somebody who was not afraid to say kind of what he was thinking. I mean, he was. And remember, Martin Luther was a, 
as a monk in the Roman Catholic Church, was very concerned about sin and, and very aware about, about his need for righteousness. And he would do all kinds of things to make himself uh, acceptable to God. Even though that wasn't possible, that was his attempt. In fact, he would confess his sins to the point that he would go to the priest to confess his sin, and he would be there not for minutes, but for hours and hours. And the priests are basically like, go away, Martin, go away. <laughs> I mean, you've said enough, but he, he was so concerned about all of this. Well, when he became a believer in Christ, he was very concerned about the scripture and very concerned about those who were more interested in these mystic experiences and so I'm reading here from a commentary that describes that when such intimidation came from the 16th century mysticism of Martin Luther's day the great reformer was very firm with them clinging to biblical revelation and the centrality and sufficiency of Christ in particular the followers of Thomas Munger Mun, I'm sorry Mun, yeah, Mun, M-U-N-Z-E-R Munzer, and the radical Anabaptists gave great prominence to the work and gifts of the Spirit and to mystical knowledge. Their cry expressing their super their supra biblical experience was the Spirit, the Spirit. Luther replied, I will not follow where their spirit leads. And when they were granted the privilege of an interview with Luther, they gave their cry, the Spirit, the Spirit. The great reformer was not impressed and thundered, I slap your spirit on the snout. Now, I mean, <laughs> uh, that's one way to deal with it. And now he wasn't being necessarily disrespectful. What he was doing was saying, what you're doing is hanging on to these experiences and not ultimately toward the word of God. And that's where your emphasis needs to be. All right, let's go to the last one. Verse 20 if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Here he's referring to experiences that essentially involve asceticism. So we talked about the idea of legalism, these lists of do's and don'ts, if you will, and how that supposedly is to make us mature, or these these extra biblical experiences somehow that will make us more like Jesus. But now he talks about these issues of abstaining really from religious taboos. He talks about asceticism. Let me paint a scenario again with you to kind of illustrate this. What's that smell? Oh, it's me. I haven't taken a bath for over a month. You see, I do not want to indulge in the luxury of bathing. I also have restricted my diet to nothing but water, lettuce, and an occasional insect for protein. Certainly God must be pleased with my devotion to him. I'm doing all of this for him, you know. I've been careful not to touch any unclean thing. I have often awakened, uh, remained awake at night. Sometimes I've slept standing up. I do this to gain discipline and to please God. I'm seeking through the punishment of my body to gain release from wrong thoughts and attitudes. And so somebody says, how's it working? Well, I have ways to go. <laughs> and if I hadn't taken a bath for a week or a month, you would say, maybe you should go. But anyway, um, what does it mean to be an aesthetic aesthetic and what and what are the consequences of that well rigorous self-denial in the lifestyle of ascetic basically is that um, here Paul talks about don't handle don't taste don't touch these restrictions of certain things we shouldn't do um, the underlying idea here for those who fell into this idea was that um, the body is the enemy and has to be buffeted. Remember that this Gnostic idea was that all physical things were evil and only spirit was good. So in order for you to be more spiritual, you needed to beat up the body. You've watched people in certain uh, cultures beat themselves until they bleed or do certain things to somehow um, uh, either get 
the attention of God or to somehow try to um, cause yourself not to be tempted. For example, if I believe that I can overcome temptation by beating myself up, if I beat myself up, guess what's going to happen? It's not going to affect the temptation issues. In fact, it might even heighten those. Self-denial does not necessarily produce any kind of spirituality, probably doesn't, and furthermore, it's not spiritually motivated. While there is some profit in physical exercise, there is no power to sanctify the soul by the discipline of the body. Now, I, I'm the first to admit that I should do more physically in, in terms of being more physically fit, but ultimately it's not about the physical in terms of my spiritual relationship with Jesus I can be uh, I, that doesn't give us the that doesn't give us the right to be a um, bloated couch potato but it does say to us that that we it's not about the physical things that matter some people that are very physically minded give tons of attention and effort and energy toward running and exercising and working out and and their routine says two hours a day three hours a day they do this but they don't have time for reading the word they don't have time for spiritual disciplines there's something wrong with that we've gotten out of order discipline as a way to godliness is an assumption that's not true frustration and defeat are the consequences of that kind of lifestyle Asceticism masquerades as wisdom, but it amounts to a self-made religion that leads to false humility. Again, we start looking at this and saying, I'm better than those guys. Alexander McLaren, a commentator from a past generation, says, there's only one thing that will put a collar on the neck of the animal within us, and that is the power of the indwelling Christ. Warren Wiersbe said it this way, Christ's power within does more than give us the power of restraint. It places new desires within. Law on the outside is not necessary because there is life on the inside. End quote. The conclusion that Paul makes to all this is, but they, that is these issues, asceticism and legalism and mysticism, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Whatever temptations to sin, whatever's out there, you try those three areas in your life and they don't work. Only when we give ourselves to Christ and, and begin to immerse ourselves in the Word of God and trusting in the Spirit of God to change us does maturity happen. We want to come to spiritual maturity doesn't come through legalism or mysticism or asceticism. It will come through the appropriation of the power of the indwelling Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read this quote from John MacArthur. He says, I can remember being in a situation when I was greatly intimidated. I actually became paranoid about the things I did because I felt that those were the only things that were validating my spirituality. A man came to me one time and said, you're not spiritual. <clears throat> and I said to him, how do you know I'm not spiritual? He said, because you don't go to prayer meetings. I said, what does that have to do with my spirituality? How do you know I don't spend all day and all night in prayer? He said, spiritual people go to prayer meetings. <laughs> so <clears throat> I have gone through that kind of legalism, and I know what it's like. You don't need to be intimidated by that. There are some things that are moral issues but you don't need to let some narrow-minded person intimidate you and force you spiritually outside of those issues. Second, spiritually to some, spirituality to some people is Christ plus a special vision or Christ plus a special experience. I've heard people say, have you experienced the deeper life? I said, what is it? I've never understood what they were talking about. I went through some of my college days with real anxiety in my heart because I couldn't experience a deeper life. Somebody in a testimony would say, since I had the second blessing or since I realized this certain thing, I've experienced the higher walk. I didn't know what they were talking about and I felt like I was just doing the same old thing. Some people were higher and some were deeper and I was neither. I went through that kind of intimidation. I'm trying to tell you what Paul said. If you have Christ, you have everything. 
If you have his word, you have all you need. If you have his spirit, you have all you need. Don't let anybody tell you that you need to add a system of works righteousness, special visions and revelations, and an aesthetic lifestyle or of self-denial. If you're looking for your spirituality in any of these areas, you just passed it by. Don't be guilty of intimidating somebody else. We tend to intimidate others by what we say. We tend to encourage them by what we do. There are some, end quote, there are some things that will enhance our spiritual growth. And we're going to learn about those in chapter 3. But for now, we need to remember that those three aren't going to get it for us. Now, we all have certain ideas about legalism. I have some. Um, I read Romans chapter 14 today for a reason. Whatever hang-ups I have, I have to be careful, I think, in my own heart, not to do those things because it would violate my conscience. But I also have to be careful not to condemn you for doing them, if they're an all-moral issue. Now, if you walk into a store and you steal something, that's sin. You have stolen. If you start your lawnmower on Sunday afternoon, it's not sin. I may have a hard time with it, but that's my issue. That's not yours. You have to deal with that with your conscience. See, we would like to reduce Christianity to a list of do's and don'ts, I think, because that way we can check them off. So if we could come up with the seven deadly sins of the Christian or something, you know, then as long as we didn't do that, we'd feel pretty good about ourselves. And we'd also feel pretty superior to everybody who didn't match up. But that's not what Christianity is about. That's not what maturity is about. It's about glorifying Christ. It's about having a clear conscience before God. It's about living for Jesus and glorifying his name. It's about helping others to grow in their walk with Jesus. That's really where we are. We're going to get to that in chapter 3. It's a big challenge, though, because we're all struggling with those three issues. but he's called us to something better. May God give us the grace to help us to grow up in him. Father, thank you for allowing us the privilege of looking in your word, spending a little bit of time trying to get a handle on what it means to be mature in Christ. Today, kind of the negative stuff, but help us to realize that it is so good to know you. It's so good to be able to, to grow up in you, to have heart that's centered on you and fixed on you, a heart that's desiring you more than anything else, and not comparing ourselves with others or thinking our situation is better than somebody else's, but always remembering that we're growing in you, and it's about us and you and our relationship and how it is. So we've got a ways to go. We've got some confessing to do, probably. We've got some responsibilities in terms of cleaning up some of that attitudes and some of the thoughts of our life that really haven't been very biblical. We have some challenges, and all that's part of the maturing process. So we pray that you'll help us. Help us to be gracious people, loving people, faithful people, believing people, godly people, for the glory of Christ and for the good of his family. We pray in Jesus' name.